The third point is, I would argue that there's a lot of periodicity there, that there is prosodic structure, that he's got a lot of integration of his facial expressions and other things, that non-manual markers that mark structure in sign languages that, that are used around the world. Okay, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna skip over this part, except to say, again, the home signers I'm talking about in this study are people who have no arrows. They have not become part of the deaf community. I'm gonna say it again. They're not signers of a sign language. <laughs> They're not interacting with each other or with other deaf people. And thank you, Tom Weber. They're not signers of a sign language. They don't interact with other deaf people or each other. <laughs> so, I'm going to cover this very briefly as well. We know from several of the previous speakers that some representations of number don't require language. The small exact numbers, one, two, three, and large approximate representations, which are shared with uh, members of other non-human species. We also have some evidence that language, particularly, and this is a point that maybe we can talk about in the discussion, whether language in general or specifically count words or even, you know, count words that are presented in a sequence, right? Which, of, which part of that is, seems to be crucial for development of representations of large exact number. Uh, we know that there are languages that are sparse in terms of their lexical representations of those quantities and that they have trouble with large exact number representation. What I'm going to argue now is that um, these are language effects and not cultural effects because also in those cultures, it's been argued that they just don't need or want to talk about uh, exactly 15 things or exactly 22 things or exactly 7 things. So, um, home signers represent a case where they're living in a numeric culture and they do have a lot of social and cultural pressure to talk about those things. They're using money uh, on more or less a daily basis. Uh, they, they have a lot of artifacts. They build things. They, they use things, and they need to know how many there are. So I'll draw your attention to the bottom here. If cultural support is enough, home signers should look like hearing adults with a count list and show evidence of large exact number representations However, if language is necessary, we should see only evidence for small exact and large approximate numbers. So we uh, did many, many, many tasks assessing accuracy of home signers' gestures. And um, the, there are four participants in this study who range in age from 20 to 29. They've each been using home signing exclusively to communicate with the people around them for their entire lives. We showed them cards that had different numbers of objects on them, ranging from 1 to 20. And we just asked them to tell us what was on the card. And they had no trouble understanding this task. I mean, I should just note, I, I have worked with these same four people um, since 1996. So I, I can, can communicate with them fairly well. Uh, I can tell when they do and don't understand things. I don't always think they understand me for sure. But uh, this task was very easy to convey. <coughs> We had timed and untimed presentation. So you're gonna see the untimed condition here where he has as much time as he wants to try and figure out how many things are on this card. I should also say we helped them as much as we could because it was obvious from the very outset that they were having a lot of trouble with this, a fact which surprised their family members a great deal. They had no idea that they were very poor at this kind of task. So, um, but the data I'm going to show you are drawn only from the first attempt that they were doing themselves alone without any help from us. But I just want to say that there was a lot of assistance provided along the way uh, on subsequent trials. So he's looking at uh, 14, they're actually fish, but I only had the dogs with me. And you can see what he's doing. He looks like he's doing some sort of accounting, something but it's not going to get into the right answer. And in fact, it's only gonna get into the right answer about 50% of the time. So he's going back to the other strategy, and he, he knows what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, he knows the behaviors. Okay, and then he says 12, and he expresses it like this, 10 and then two. 
Sorry, and then I saw, I'm sorry, I talked over the next one. When there's only two, he immediately says two. He has no problem with that. So this is a very, very busy slide. Um, what I want to draw your attention to are uh, how the home signers compare in their gesture accuracy with hearing people who also have not been to school, like they have not been to school, but who crucially the hearing people, they speak Spanish. They've acquired the Spanish account list. And they consequently have very little trouble with this task. So what you see on the right side is the timed presentation where we just showed it like this. Okay, they could, they could only see it for about one second. And this is these results are consistent with many, many others in the literature. Everybody is, is approximate. When there's a very small number, you're pretty good, but as the number gets longer, you're approximately right, your number, your response increases with the number of objects. Now, when hearing people who have a count list have as much time as they need or want to assess the number of objects on the page, they're also very, very good. They're almost perfect. But home signers are still approximate. After one, two, and three, well, they're also pretty good at some of the other small numbers, but crucially, for numbers above five, they are approximately correct. They look the same as if when they've only seen it for one second. Okay, so maybe this is a linguistic problem, right? We're asking them to respond using language, using their means of linguistic expression. What about performance on tasks that don't require a gesture response? We also did a series of nonverbal tasks that were essentially matched to sample, make your set like my set. And we did many, many, many permutations of these. These are not even all the tasks, but they, they fall into two main categories. The intramodal tasks, where the presentation of the objects is the same as the format that, in which they have to respond. So disks, the experimenter puts out disks, the home signer must put out disks. Um, tactile, where the experimenter would knock, and then the deaf person would have to knock. And then these cross-modal versions, where they, they were in different modes. So the experimenter would put out disks, and the participant would have to knock. I want to give you one example of what this looked like. So this is a tactile matching. So this is my colleague, Elizabeth Spotman. She, she will knock four times, and then you can see for yourself, he responds five times. by Sarneka and Gelman, where we had presentations of a certain number of items, we told the home signer how many there were, and then there were transformations that did not change, oh, that's what I'm saying. There were transformations that did not change the quantity, so either just looking at them, stirring them around, or uh, taking one out and adding it back. And what you see here on the y-axis is the proportion of trials in which the subject <coughs> repeated back the original number, which is the correct thing to do, right? Because you haven't changed the quantity. However, when you subtract one or you double the number, they never give you back the exact quantity. And for over 95% of the responses, they did give the, the a magnitude that was either more or less, depending on what the transformation had been. So we interpret those results to mean that home signers do know there's a right answer, um, especially in the economy. We, we do these tasks for many, many hours, right? And we, it was very clear that they knew they were not doing well. So uh, uh, every, all the evidence points to uh, them knowing that there's a right answer, but really not being able to get there reliably. So just to sum up, um, I'm saying the count list here, but really it could be any of those three things that I mentioned earlier. It appears to be necessary to develop concepts of large exact number, and home signers perform poorly even though they have a lot of cultural pressure to develop these kinds of representations. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to the 
the linguistic part. So if we look at home signers' uh, sentences, the lang their language production when they're talking about number, do we see any kinds of linguistic expressions that involve number? So the questions I'm going to ask are whether number gestures mark linguistic contrast, in particular the one I'm going to be showing you evidence for is one versus more than one, and whether number gestures function as arguments and predicates in their syntax. So we saw evidence of, sorry, um, this task is a slightly more naturalistic task where they saw 10 short vignettes of things that would happen. So they would see 10 sheep in a pen, and then a wolf comes in, uh, sorry, two of the sheep would run out, a wolf comes in, one of them dies, the rest run back. In this case, one runs back, it's actually one of them. So the stimuli were designed in a way that each short vignette would offer many opportunities to express small and large numbers. And there were 10 stories overall. What we saw when we looked at how the home signers expressed those different quantities were basically three main devices. Finger extensions, so this is something like this, where the number of fingers indicates the number of objects. Punctuated movements, which were gestures that incorporated the size and the shape of the object that was being described or the action and were very distinct in their endpoints. So something like this to respond to four flower pots in a row. And it, an unpunctuated movement, which was basically the same kind of movement, but with a very, very brief iteration of like a little bump in it. Okay, so it's essentially one gesture but it has these short iterations, very small iterations. And I'll show you actual uh, home sign examples of these. Here's an example of a finger extension in a sentence. Here's an example of a punctuated movement device. Unpunctuated movement. So then you're going to see this sort of sweepy movement that has a couple of internal bumps. Okay. So how accurate are these gestures with respect? We know what they're trying to say, right? Because we we control the stimuli that they're describing. So it turns out that. The finger extensions and the punctuated movements, I mean, we already know that they're not great at assessing uh, quantities that are larger than three, right? So we don't expect our accuracy to be really high here, and in fact it isn't. But it is they're both significantly higher than the accuracy for the unpunctuated movements. So we, on the basis of these accuracy results, grouped these two types into quantified gestures, where we felt that they were trying to actually track the exact number of objects or actions versus the unquantified, which really didn't seem to bear any relation to the number of items in the set, and those are the data I'm going to show you next. What was the measure of accuracy? So, what accuracy referred to? What? Accuracy referred to, I'm sorry, accuracy referred to for the finger extensions just how the number of components in the gesture, right? So, the gesture has nine components, but there were really ten sheep in the pen. Okay, so that would be not accurate. And then for the punctuated movements, there were, so that would be four, and then depending on what it was they were describing in the vignette, that's what we evaluated it with respect to. The number of those little iterations, right? Those little bumps. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't change the terminology on the slide. Specified is quantified and unspecified is unquantified. So what we see for the relationship between the number of components in a quantified gesture related to the target set is a very nice linear relationship that really seems like they're trying to track exactly how many there are. In contrast, for the unquantified that you're sort of interpreting to be like a plural, 
It doesn't matter how many are in the target set, you're getting more or less two, more or less two little iterations in those movements. Uh, so the results I just showed you were from those four adult home signers. We had run the same task in the same way with a child home signer who was uh, seven and a half, and he shows a very similar pattern, the distinction between these two different devices. So now I want to move to the combinations. So do combinations, including number devices, act like sentences in one time? That is, do they follow the typical word order pattern that we see in home sign sentences that don't have number devices in them? So from previous work, we know that the dominant orders tend to be, I mean, they're basically argument predicate in these different kinds of semantics. So what we're counting in this, the next slide, the charts I'll show you, are um, when the finger extension, when the number device functions like an argument, stands in for the number of sheep that, that go, we expect it to show up in the first slot, okay, before the verb. When it stands in for an entity, like um, these two cups, for example, are upright, we expect it to show up in the first slot. And again, when it functions as a locative predicate, we expect it to show up after the argument. So something like cup, many in a line. So um, these, you don't see any error bars here because these are all the data. Okay, there's no averaging here by the participant. So, uh, basically, they're all showing the same pattern, and let me just go through a little bit what that pattern is. So for the, the sentences that they produced that didn't have a number device in them, they um, very, uh, almost all the time, produce the dominant order, right, the argument predicate order. When the number device happens on the argument, so like for G go, you also get that dominant order. When the number device occurs on the predicate, so like a cup in a line, you get the same order. And then this one is the most variable, um, and she, in fact, these two are the most variable. When there's a number device on the argument and the predicate, the word order is a little bit less reliable, but that's the minority of cases. So you might be thinking, these people are talking to the hearing people around them all the time. Maybe they're getting these devices from the hearing people. And in particular, we know that in many, many cultures around the world, people use their hands to express number, right? So um, we think it's quite likely that for at least these finger extensions, which would be in the quantified set here, that they're drawn from the culture at large. However, for the unquantified devices, the pattern that, oh, sorry, so the pattern that we see for quantified devices is the dark bars, the black bars represent the home signers, and the white bars represent their partners, okay? And what we see in each case is that they both represent, both home signers and their partners produce quantified number devices for all 10 stories, except for there's one missing here, right? So the y-axis is the number of stories that they describe that contain this kind of device. For the unquantified, devices, we see quite a different pattern. So in each case, these are all significantly different. The home signer is much more likely to use this unquantified or plural device in more stories than the hearing communication partner. And uh, of course, if you're really interested in the, where the structure is coming from, when these are combined with other gestures, it turns out that the number of combinations that include unquantified plural devices produced by hearing people is four total across the four communication partners. And two of them are in the dominant order and two are not. It's, I mean, it's vanishingly rare. So to sum up, um, I'd like to argue that home signers number expressions function as linguistic elements. They distinguish one versus more than one. They stand in for arguments and predicates, and they're integrated into home sign grammar. And uh, what I did mention before is that these devices, all three of them, are very, very similar and resemble in form and function 
the number of devices used in established sign languages all over the world. However, in spite of this robust linguistic manifestation, they do not appear to function as summary symbols. They don't, I didn't show you this data, but they don't have standard forms within an individual, so you can get um, eight expressed like this, um, or like this. Uh, there, there's a lot of variability in there. Also, gestures expressing large numbers don't confer an advantage in working memory relative to small number gestures and <coughs> gestures. Um, you can ask me about that in the discussion period, but that's um, other work that we're that's ongoing that has not yet been rejected. Um, and also, the number expressions do are not embedded within an ordered list, so it does not look like home signers are able to exploit a successor function. We're still uh, working on quantifying that. I do have a very nice example that I think I have time to show you. Five, you just said? So what are some of the implications of these findings? Uh, a conventional count list apparently doesn't emerge in a single individual, but in a community setting, even if others who don't already have a count list, presumably, who are coming in with home sign systems like the ones I've just shown you, um, that seems to be enough. Once they're all getting together, the count list apparently emerged very, very quickly because it, it was already there before Judy's, they had a count list. They, brought, they were counting. They had numbers. But they they had numbers. They couldn't, give you they couldn't give you a list, but it came really early because as early as we started looking, it's there. Yeah. So I'm going to argue that natural, this is not news, right? Natural number representations have multiple components. However, in the typical case where you have a child learning a language, all of these things come together, right? The numbers function as words, they're integrated into the language, they function as summary symbols, they help you in working memory, they do all of these things in the typical case when you get them early. But the case of home signers who are deprived of such linguistic input give us some insight into which components may require linguistic input and, um, and which ones don't and how they relate to each other. So as I kind of already mentioned, we're now looking at whether number gestures function as linguistic symbols in terms of working memory. And we're also looking at the limits of this one-to-one -one correspondence strategy that we saw many of the home signers using, even though it tended not to be, it was not reliably successful, but it was more successful for smaller, and I'm, by that I mean fewer than 10, um, than for <coughs> larger numbers. I'm going to show you an example that I think, didn't think I would have time to. I want to argue that, um, I sort of already alluded to this, very uneven profile of number representations. So in this task, I haven't described any data from this task, but what we asked them to do was order a set of cards that had between 1 and 20 dots on them. And the home sign I'm going to show you is the absolute best one of this group. And he has correctly, it took him 20 minutes, okay, but he correctly ordered these cards from 1 to 18 and then he had flipped 19 to 20. So this is exactly what they look like. So this is not an easy task. If you, I mean, it takes a long time even when, it takes a long time for us to count these, right, and order them, but not 20 minutes. So he's, he has now put those in front of him and we're probing to see how much he understands how they relate to each other. So the way we, what is the control? We have done this with hearing people and they don't have any problem with this. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, yeah, that's, this, I'm not at the interesting part yet. I mean, we can talk about this, but this isn't the interesting part. The interesting part is, what happens when you turn those over? Okay, so what we did was, Alicia is sitting working with him. She asks him to assess this one, okay? And he eventually gets to 13. We turn it over. And then we turn over the next one and ask him how many are on there. Okay, and that's what you're gonna see. Okay, so look at it carefully because you didn't tell me the right number the first time. This guy is also really good at chunking into fives, but he doesn't need to use his hands. He's just looking and he's sort of grouping them into fives. Okay, so he just said 12. I'm sorry, he said 13, like this. 10 and 3. 
So do you see the look on his face? Like, how am I supposed to know what's on the next one? You just turn over.